Hi, I'm going to talk to you about the multifaceted nature of Shahjahanabad, which has evoked the spirit of shared culture since its inception. It has been the fertile ground to nurture the aspirations of the Indian and Central Asian visionaries. From its inception, the city has evoked the spirit of shared cultures, be in its planning principles, the inhabiting communities, its economic growth, and especially in being a ground for generation of a unique cultural high point in the context of the Indian subcontinent. Let me begin by sharing a beautiful map illustrating the travels of Ibn Battuta, the Moroccan traveler and scholar who chronicled his accounts in a gift to those who contemplate the wonders of cities and marvels of traveling. This map is a National Geographic illustration de demonstrating that even in the early 14th century, the human mind the human mind which chose to excel drew from the knowledge of a global resource to the extent of its own reach and vision. Shah Jahan was born under the same constellation of stars as his ancestor Akbar believed the prediction that his astrologers and decided Akbar believed the prediction of his astrologers and decided to nurture his grandchild Kutub to be the most significant emperor of Mughal Hindustan. Babur, the first Mughal ruler of India, was a direct descendant of Emperor Timur a Chaktai Turk on his father's side and Chengiz Khan on his mother's side. Akbar's mother was Persian. His son Jahangir had a Rajput mother and so did his grandson Shah Jahan. The Mughals by descendant had already become sons of the soil. And look at the Mughal culture as alien to India. Central Asia was the zone in which Shah Jahan wanted to outshine. Both Istanbul and Isfahan in all its wealth and cultural lifestyle. Shah Jahan sent his envoys to study Shah Abbas's splendid city Isfahan. They came back with accounts of the city core, the central axes, the promenades, the maidans, the palaces, the Jama Masjid, the bazaars, the neighborhood structures, and of course, the way water played an important role in shaping the city, in dispersing with the public spaces and gardens. The pre-Islamic Persian rulers and nobles had constructed elaborately landscape retreats, and this idea prevailed in the Islamic concept of paradise on earth, shaded areas, fruiting and flowering trees with constantly flowing water. This set the benchmark for the city Shah Jahan would build. The selection of a location for building the city of Shah Jahan was a systematic study of understanding the placements of the past capitals in the Indian subcontinent, along with those in Central Asia. A strategic location for an empire, a beautiful site with a mild climate, somewhere between Agra and Lahore was desired. The site on the right bank of Yamuna, at the point where the descendant of the Shesha Suri had built a fortification, the Salim Bird, was hard to falter with. This site was north of the progression of the previous settlements placed along the river bank in Delhi. Firosha Tughlaqs, Firozabad. The northern tip of Delhi was the perfect geopolitical location with the Aravali range encircling a fertile alluvial bowl landform on the west and the river Yamuna on the east. This spot was easily navigable from Agra by boat and by land connected to the hinterland, which would ensure a continuous supply of food, enable trading and ensure prosperity. The topography was befitting. Shah Jahan's dream to create a city with a twin focus the palace citadel and the Jama Masjid. Hydrology one, was one of the prime factors for the placement of the new city 
north of the previously existing settlements along the riverbank. It ensured that cleaner water would be available to its inhabitants. Ali Mardan Khan from Iran was brought in to revive the canal built by Sultan Firoz Shah Tughlaq in the mid 14th century. To bring in water from a point upstream on the river Yamuna to provide a year round supply. The canal was then designed to run on the outskirts of the city, watering the gardens and fields. It entered the city by the Kabuli Gate in the northwestern part and then split into two branches. One branch flowed down in the middle of Chandni Chowk and the other one passed through the gardens north of Chandni Chowk. This second branch then entered the palace citadel near the Shah Burj. The most evolved settlements of any period have been the ones who used state-of-the-art technology sourced from anywhere in the world where it could be found. Charja city and citadel is an expression of using all available resources to find a natural setting to build his dream capital city where the topography, the built fabric, the people and the culture it nurtures shape the settlement. Sharjah had a very highly cultivated aesthetic sense and planned everything on a very large and noble scale. The twin elevated focal points, the Jama Masjid and the Palace Citadel, formed the key to the comparison. Long before Paris set the fashion in 1670 AD of having the principal streets flanked with the avenues and boulevards, in 1630, uh, in 1638, Shahja planned a beautiful boulevard in Delhi, the Changi Chow. It had marked similarity with Unter de Laden in Berlin, founded later by Frederick the Great in 1740, the grandest example of the boulevard in Europe. According to the French physician and traveler Bernier in his travels in Mughal Empire during 1658 to 1668, he states that Shahjah's capital was the most magnificent palace in the East, perhaps the world. This wall mural depicting the visit in 1842 of the Kota Maharao Ram Singh to the Mughal court portrays the magnificence of scale of the royal residence and the richness of the decorative parts, both on the built fabric and the furnishings that it cladded. The palace citadel, though fortified, was not designed as a defensible entity. It was entered from the riverside through the Mutamban Burj, the octagonal tower, and from the city side, from the Lahori Darwaza, which directly opened onto the city's Lahori Darwaza, leading to the ceremonial promenade Chandni Chowk. The addition of a defensible enclosure and another gateway in front of the Lahori Darwaza was done in the reign of Aurangzeb. The formal plan of Shah Janabad combines the Persian town planning components with the principles of laying out settlements as stated in the Mansara a Vastu Shastra scripture dating from 400 to 600 AD. The plan form is guided by the semi-elliptical design called the Karmuk or bow for a site fronting a river or seashore. An adaptation of this city plan was made to fit in with the Central Asian cosmology of the capital city, being located on the Aksai Mundi, the center of earth and the intersect of celestial and the mundane. The capital stood as a symbol of the ruler's power and wealth, an example of his ability to order the world around him into regular, harmonious and even beautiful shapes and patterns. Within the walled and the gated settlement, the components of the urban design were structured by the actual plan. It was one of its kind, mid 17th century, planned settlement with a twin axis, one originating from the running east-west called the Changi Chowk and the other north-south, Fez Bazaar, now called Darya Ganj. 
the east-west tree-lined axial promenade with the canal of paradise, Nehre Brisht, flowing through the center was punctuated by two squares, the Chandni Chowk and the Kotwali Chabutra. It was divided in three distinct sections. The first 480 long bazaar from Lahuri Gate to the Chowk of Kotwali Chabutra was called the Urdu Bazaar. It served the imperial household. The second section from Kotwali Chabutra to Chandni Chok was built by Jahanara Begum. It was also 480 yards long. It served as the financial section of the street, was called the Ashafi Bazaar, the money changers market or the Jauri Bazaar, the jewelers market. In the center of the Chok, Jahanara Begum built an octagonal pool 100 yards in size which reflected the moonlight and thus was known as Changni Chok, the moonlight square. This chalk was flanked on the north by a sarai and on the south by a hammam. The final section of the street ran about 560 yards from Changni Chok to Fatehpuri Masjid and was called the Fatehpuri Bazaar. These three segments of the largest and richest Bazaar streets of Shah Janabad were later referred to as Chandni Chowk. 1,520 1, yards long, containing 1,650 shops and porticos built in the year 1650. The other major bazaar streets that link Delhi Gate to the fort of the Delhi Gate of, sorry, Major Bazaar Street linked the delegate of the fort to the delegate of the city and was built by Akbar Badi Begum. Originally known as the Bazaar in the direction of Akbar Badi, Akbar Abad, it later came to be called the Fez Bazaar or the Bazaar of Plenty. A Neher flowed through the center of this street and both the sides of the road were strewn with shops. It is now known as the Riyak Ganj. Another important bazaar connected the western edge of Jama Masjid to Hoz Kazi. This street is now known as Chauri Bazaar. It was famous for copperware. In addition to these main streets, numerous specialized markets existed in the city and these were backed up by artisan workshops which produced high value goods. The street and the area was named based on the occupational speciality, for example, Balimaran, the Riba Kalan, Asharfi Katra, Neel Katra, and so on. Within the formal structure of the city sections were carved out, sorry, within the formal structure of the city sections were carved out and within each section, the growth was organic in nature determined by the specific needs of the section. A cosmopolitan capital had a mix of people from all parts of the empire and beyond. Physical relationships were shaped by the structure of political, social, occupational and economic relationships. The city was a gem in the Indian subcontinent. A hierarchical management system was put in place where communities from the empire and beyond were encouraged to coexist and nurture mutual growth and prosperity with a highly regulated framework. Eckhart Elias and Thomas Kraft described this system of organization. The city was divided into 12 thanas, each controlled by a thanedar. Each thana was subdivided into several mohallas under the responsibility of mohalladars, a total of 36 mohallas. The formal entry point of the Mohalla was sealed off and could be entered only by a gate. The spatial system of the city was based on an extensive hierarchical organization which allowed a heterogeneous population to live together. Eckelhardt Elliers and Thomas Kraft's painstaking research to locate and reconstruct a hand-drawn, hand-colored map from the Oriental Indian Office collection of Shah Janabad into a scaled drawing 
with immense detail has been pathbreaking. The incomplete coloring on the map refers to the urban differentiation into wards or thanas. This map placed the level of scholarship for Shah Janabad to a level where authenticity of the historic fabric and urban geography pre-mutiny can be studied in relation to the transformations done in the colonial period and the post-independence interventions. The original hand-drawn map, 100 centimeters by 100 centimeters, is a unique piece of cartography and is available in the map section of the Orient and India Office Collections, London. It was used by Kraft and Elias to create the reconstruction of the settlement around 1850. This is a segment of, of a plan of the city of Delhi in 1876, surveyed under the superintendent E. J. Martin for the Municipal Committee of Delhi. This map is a good reference to understand the transition of spaces from the public realm to the private. The underlying street structure and the hierarchy of street typologies move from the public to the semi-private, the katra, the kucha, the gali, located in the mohalla. They have remained unchanged despite the multiple forces and contingencies having transformed Shah Jahanabad from a Mughal to a British colonial and finally an independent Indian city. The typology of spaces which foster interaction of communities in different scales range from the private courtyards to the baths and bagichas, gardens laid out by begums and sahibs. The shared private core of a residence was the inner courtyard, which opened up to the semi-private spaces. An academic study of the Mungewali Paveli by the SPS students illustrates the transition from semi-private street to an alley and then to an open to sky courtyard. The interrelationship of the multiple inhabitant units to the single entity of the Mokewali Haveli can be understood from this slide. The urban fabric has been adapted to the changing needs of every new generation, its aspirations, and yet the underlying historic system is still in place in a very meaningful way. The historic fabric of Shah Jahanabad has been mutilated numerous times and then sprung back to life, for example, post sacking of Delhi by Nader Shah. The significant periods of historic transformations have been numerous in the life of Delhi. However, for the purpose of this talk, we will focus on two most significant periods, one post-mutiny by the British and the next post-partition, triggered by the exchange of populations between India and Pakistan. Wilson's survey map made in 1910 is a very accurate indicator of the changes brought about by the Raj. Each imperial regime Each imperial regime with its desire to leave a lasting imprint on the core of the city is well exhibited by the construction of the town hall by the British to replace, replace Jahanara Begum's Sarai. In their best understanding of town planning principles, a clock tower was erected in place of the Moonlight Pool. A new street running south of the town hall square was sliced out through the settlement with little, little understanding of the morphology of the historic fabric. The Nehere Bisht, the stream of paradise, was filled up and the bounties of the industrial era were showered on the city, the trams as a modern way of rapid transport. The British in their country were building garden cities. However, in India, where a garden city existed, they could not relate to the typology of the bags and the beaches. The northern section of the city was sliced into two halves by bringing in the railways, another intervention which could have been dealt with sensitivity in the heritage city. 
Under the fear of expected uprising from within the city, the British destroyed the connection between the fort and the city by making a clearing which destroyed the eastern fringe, including an important bazaar street, the Khas Bazaar. In this complex heritage zone, where the demographic profile has undergone several changes, especially during partition, when the Muslims fled to Pakistan and Hindus occupied the properties evacuated by them, the issue of ownership stands unresolved. The evacuee properties are poorly maintained, passed from one occupant to the next by means of informal transactions. They are subdivided and extended in ad hoc manner. The properties which are rented out cannot be maintained by owners as the rents cannot be made proportionate to the property value. Chandni Chowk has undergone many historic transformations. Sporadic efforts at multiple levels have been made by the government to redevelop this historic core. Shahjana Bad Redevelopment Corporation was set up a not-for-profit organization to promote conservation of built and natural heritage in the national capital region of Delhi, which needs to be protected, nourished, and maintained by all its citizens. Conservation as an attitude has to be imbibed in the city's urban development process. This would ensure conservation of civic and urban heritage, which would include architecturally significant and artisanal works, historic landmarks, living monuments, having social, cultural value. I will run you through the Chandni Chowk Redevelopment Project briefly. It is unfortunate that when funds are made available and a nodal agency like FNDC is formulated for the specific task of conservation, the heritage values of the settlement are ignored and incompatible solutions are developed. In case of public land and property, most decisions are driven by political motives which do not factor in any heritage or town planning concerns. The recent redevelopment venture to retrofit infrastructure in Chanejo was designed to give a highway treatment to this processional ceremonial axis of the city and buy all the services on the central axis of the promenade, which once, where once flowed the stream of paradise, a hydrological achievement in its time. Lack of due processes in conception of this design and approvals of the scheme was questioned by concerned citizens. DUAC approvals were bypassed and implementation was commenced. It was only by legal recourse that the situation could be salvaged. All utilities, toilets, urinals, police boats, etc., other than the transformers, were moved away from the central verge to locations identified by the petitioners and DUAC. This has only part salvaged the situation and much needs to be done. I would like to emphasize it um, I would like to emphasize is how communities and government can come together firstly to appreciate the value embedded in the heritage and then to come up with a vision to revive the vibrant multifaceted nature of this settlement. The key issues which need to be addressed, is the social and physical of each section of the settlement, leading to the development of regulations at each mohalla level, which will factor in the occupational skills of the inhabitants, their economic growth and habitability standards. Digital survey tools and technology make it very simple for us to collate data, which then will form a scientific basis to formulate a matrix for the settlement's needs, both the physical fabric and inhabitant communities. It is not enough to list buildings as has been experienced in the past. This triggers off the fear of unknown, as several years ago, when the municipal corporation notified 187 properties as protected, demolitions were undertaken by owners, not knowing 
what the protection entailed. Haskar ki Haveli in the Kashmir quarter is one such important example which we could not say. The current inhabitants, especially those who have occupied the city post-partition, need to be sensitized about the shared heritage values embodied in the fabric so as to appreciate and look after what belongs to them now. This by no means is an easy task as most occupants only relate to the asset, asset's value as an economic gain. If inhabitants who have become affluent have moved to New York, newer parts of the city can contribute in unique ways by forming a digital transfatal committee uh, community which can interact with the resident communities. Human contact is really important for humanity. Post the pandemic, we will face a real challenge. How to open this densely populated section of the city? The city has been designed for hierarchy and we can now use its original planning principle to approach the current problem. The city can be opened from the core of the house, the angan, the courtyard, to the gully, to the kucha, to the katra, to the mohalla till safety is ascertained. Because each mohalla was designed to be a self-contained unit. Self-governance needs to be encouraged to manage this pandemic. This lesson can then lead us to evolving ways in which mohalla communities can come together and work with each other at the Thana level and finally at the settlement level. The concerns and solutions voiced at a courtyard level can be evaluated and revitalization strategies can be tailored, made for each section and subsection of the settlement. SRDC was formulated with a goal that must now be put in fine print. It must be armed with professionals who can set up Mohalla level dispensaries. The Delhi government must allocate appropriate funding for research, formulation of detailed design briefs, and having a system to evaluate the schemes before in embarking on the implementation of projects. Each project must be audited for its long-term and short-term impact on social and physical infrastructure enhancement along with carrying out heritage impact studies. DUAC has carried out rejuvenation studies and these have been backed up uh, by INTAC, which has formulated the listing for Shah Janabar. INTAC has also formulated a nomination dossier for the Twin Cities of Delhi for the World Heritage Site. This remains pending by our government for action. All concerned agencies must come together, government and non-government, to strategize the revitalization of this irreplaceable heritage resource. I thank INTAC for providing this platform to share the multifaceted nature of Shah Janabad with all of you. Thank you.